Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie. I'm with the Howell Carnegie District Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, hopefully, you are here for Michigan Oddities and Rarities with Ron Rademacher. Um, if not, you're going to love it anyways. Um, <laughs> I do want to let you all know, just as a reminder, the library will be closed on Friday for a staff development day. Um, so hopefully you weren't planning on coming Friday. This, this event is scheduled to go until 7.30, which is after the library closes tonight. So the front doors will be locked and we'll all be exiting out the back. Um, if at any time during the presentation you need to step out, take a call, use the bathroom, the double doors right behind you with the big red exit sign, there's bathrooms down that hall and the exit. Um, I want to let you know about a couple upcoming programs we have here at the library. And all of these little flyers are on that back table. If I mention something you're excited about, please help yourselves. Uh, tomorrow we have an instant, no, a pressure cooker cook-along with Janice, uh, hibachi fried rice, individual brownie cakes. And you do have to register for that one. Um, after that, we also have a knit night. Uh, the next event will be next week, Wednesday, April 13th, 6 to 8. You do not need to register. That one is drop-in. And it is the first, no, second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. Um, we have a virtual event coming up. A partnership with the League of Women Voters. This one will be Tuesday, April 19th, 7 p.m. If you register online, you'll get the Zoom code for that one. Um, and last one, Well Told, an evening with audiobook narrator Luke Daniels, who I'm told is fantastic. That one will be live in person Thursday, April 21st, 6.30. No registration required. You can just drop on in. Um, like I said, these are all on the back table, and they are next to um, our little evaluation slips. We ask that you do fill these out. We use them as part of our planning. We like getting your feedback. It helps us make more events that you will like. All right. And that is all from me, I promise. I'm going to introduce our presenter. This is Ron Rademacher. He is a Michigan road trip expert. He has six books in print about road trips to out-of-the-way places in Michigan, and his first children's book came out in March. Ron operates two road trip websites, michiganbackroads.com and upnorthmichigan.com. He also has a monthly web magazine, travelinmichigan.com, and a podcast, mibackroads.com. Ron is here today to talk to us about Michigan oddities and rarities. So thank you, Ron. Take it away. Testing. How's that sound? Yes, sir. Too loud? Is it okay? Good. All right. So you heard the commercial, or most of it, uh, and I do have uh, the books. the uh, The travel books are all different. Uh, we have a special price on them. It's on the flyer. They're ordinarily fourteen ninety five, but here you can get them for twelve dollars a piece. But wait, you can get any four for forty four, or all six for sixty five. The Bob the Turtle book. Uh, it's a little bit different situation. It's the first children's book I've written. It's the first in a series of three. It's for four-year-olds and up. It's a teaching book. It teaches uh, some math, some vocabulary, some tree identification, safety in the woods. And as luck would have it, this edition has a printing error. You may never find it. It's not a typo. There's an extra word on one page. But because I know it's there, the book is being reprinted. So this is half price. You can get it for 10 bucks. Uh, and it's, there, it's designed for little kids, little hands, and that's the end of the, uh, I'll be glad to answer questions about the books. This program that we're going to do tonight is Oddities and Rarities, and it's based roughly on uh, my Oddities and Rarities book. Now, my websites get a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic, and the only email address on the websites is mine. So if you send me an email, I will answer that email. I'll be the one who does it, and I read all of them. And I get a lot of emails. Some uh, are very pertinent to what I just said. They're usually things like, did you know that on page 37 you misspelled? Right, I get a lot of those. <laughs> and then the other one I get so many of is, hey, I grew up in that area. And what you're talking about is nowhere near around there. You've got to be wrong about it. So I get a lot of those. And I got an email a little while back from some people from Wisconsin. And they were going to travel across the Upper Peninsula and come down through the Lower on their way to Ohio, of all places. Not sure why you would go to Ohio, but that's where they were going. 
And they wanted to, if anybody's from Ohio, don't worry, when I'm going the other way, I make fun of Wisconsin. But <clears throat> they wanted to know about some of these places that were in the book. They'd heard about it. They'd heard my podcast. They'd heard me talk about some of these out-of-the-way places. And they wanted an itinerary where they could stop a few places. And I asked them what they really wanted. And they said, well, they wanted to stay on, off the highways if they could. And they wanted them to be real things. They didn't want to go to any haunts, necessarily. They wanted real things they could put their hands on. And it wouldn't hurt if I mentioned a couple of good places to stop and stretch their legs and get something to eat. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, and I asked them if I, where I should send the invoice. <laughs> but, uh, so this is a pared-down version of that trip. And since they are coming from Wisconsin, we're going to start in White Pine. Now, the map you'll see, there's the upper and lower peninsula. And you see the star up in the left of the Keweenaw of the Upper Peninsula, that's where White Pine is. White Pine is a town which you will never find, uh, even if you're going to the Porcupine Mountains. You're, you're probably not going to find this town. It's off the beaten path. And White Pine was pretty much a ghost town. Uh, and still is pretty much a ghost town. But when it was originally a ghost town, it was because there wasn't anything there. This is rush hour back in the day in White Pine. Then a fabulously rich vein of copper was struck. And the White Pine Mining Company came in and be prepared to dig a mine. And it turned out it was going to be a deep mine. It was going to be wet. It was going to be cold. And, but there was fabulous riches to be found. And they couldn't find people to come there and work because their spouses and kids said, no, I don't want to go there where it's like that for seven months of the year. There's nothing to do there. So the company built the town of White Pine, big, wide boulevard streets. Uh, they built a school, they built a hospital, they, bought, they, they built the fire department, everything you could possibly need, still not enough. So they built a shopping mall and gave very favorable rents for good companies to come in and put shops in there. And they built an entire town so that they could do their mine. The mine was very successful. The town built up, engineers, doctors, everybody came, fantastic. 1950s come, the copper mine peters out, the copper mine closes, everybody splits. If you go to White Pine today, it is a ghost town. Even the Marathon Station is closed. There's not a bar in town. There's one bar in town, but there's no place to buy a newspaper or beer and bullets, any of that kind of stuff. What is there is the motel. Now, this is worth going to. And this is where I told our Wisconsin to stop for lunch and for the special show. This is open year-round. It's just on the edge of town. You can't find it unless you go behind the mall. And there's this motel. They have saunas there. They have hot tubs there. They have a swimming pool. They have a three-lane bowling alley. Uh, they have, you can, as snowmobilers go there and hunters go there, they can just go in and pay a, a nominal fee, get a nice hot shower. Wonderful place. And they have great food. I mean, really good food. One of the best bacon cheddar cheeseburgers I ever had in my life was in this place. Good food. But what you want to do is you want to go for the show, which happens year-round, and it happens right after the lunch hour and right after the dinner hour. And you want to get by those windows way in the back, that wall of windows. That's where you want to get to. And what happens is right after lunch and right after dinner, you'll see a cook come out of that window at the end. He'll come out of the kitchen and he'll have a great big stock pot. And he'll run out into the yard and he'll dump the kitchen scraps out. And then he will turn and he will move it getting back. There are no slow cooks working at the Contica. Because just a couple of minutes after that door closes, here comes Scruffy. This is a genuine wild bear who lives over the hill. This is a big bear. When we first saw it come out, we thought it was a buffalo or something coming out of there. This thing has paws this big. And there are now five of them. My grandson just went last summer. And he told, they told me that the Scruffy is there. And there's a, another one. And then three cubs. They come out year round. This picture is taken right through those windows. They get them up to about 15 feet. So if, you want to take, if you're going to be in the Porky's or anywhere in that part of the state and you're looking for a good place to eat and a free show, when it's dark, it's dark early some parts of the year, they turn the lights on. And these bears come out all year long except when they hibernate and when it is bear hunting season. They seem to know. So this is where I told the folks to stop uh, coming from Wisconsin on their way to the Keweenaw Peninsula. Now, we're only going to go to one spot in the Keweenaw because we have a lot to get through. I get long-winded, and I have a lot of stuff I want to show you. But that star is right at Calumet. And if you've never been to Calumet, it's well worth the trip. Uh, you get there, and there's this gigantic thermometer, uh, like 80 feet up into the air uh, by the side of the road. That's where they measure the snowfall. And their highest year was 308 inches 
of snow. And I understand they hit over 300 inches of snow this year. But what I'm going to tell you about is the Keweenaw Wall. Now, if you've not heard of this, you can Google it up. I'm not going to give you directions to it because it's on private property. But you can go as long as you don't damage anything. The owners don't mind. This is a bad picture from way, way, way back. Down on the right-hand side, it says Profile Rock. You can see some men standing up there. And they call it Profile Rock because they thought that it looked like the profile of a Native American. But no one knows if this is a natural formation or if it's man-made. And you'll see why in a minute, why it's a mystery. So this is what you're going to be going to see. It's a deep, deep, steep gorge. So you Google this up. It'll tell you exactly where to go. You park by the side of the road. There are no services. So take everything you're going to need. And you walk down this path. You'll go less than 100 yards. And you'll come to the edge of the gorge. And this will be the first glimpse you have of it. Then you can go down into the gorge. So that's me. You can see the, you can see the wall just through the trees. I'm on a, the other side of the wall, which is all broken off. And it's almost like stairs going down. Uh, I'm going to say this is probably 60 feet down into this gorge. Very steep. Make sure you're in shape for it. That's me at the bottom. You can see how tall the wall is. And notice that it's leaning to the right. So I'm standing in a dry riverbed. And about 200 yards to the direction this is leaning, it goes up. And there's a little stream coming down in a waterfall. So some people speculate that this was built as a dam to hold water there. Uh, other people say this is a natural formation. This will give you an idea of the size of the blocks that this is constructed of. They're gigantic. But you can see that they're laid in courses just like a brick wall. So this is the Keweenaw Wall. It's worth going to see if you've never been there. And everybody's waiting for somebody to figure it out. They say this was formed by an upheaval that twisted it and turned it. But there's nothing else around here that resembles this. There's no other huge upheavals of any kind in this whole part of Michigan. So there it is. And it's well worth going to. Remind your, keep in mind, if you go down into the gorge, you do have to go back up out. And that is steep. I'm actually climbing on the broken parts of the wall that goes into the hill on the other side. So a fascinating place, uh, well worth going to. It's going to take you a couple of hours. If you have extra time, drive over to Calumet and go to the high school and drive around behind the high school. And you'll see the soccer field there parked there. And you'll see a huge area of bedrock, as big as this room we're in. And if you examine it, you'll see that the rocks are cut in scratches this wide, going in different directions. That spot is where three glaciers were colliding as the glaciers receded back when I was a young man. <clears throat> so uh, that's fascinating to see, too. And there's a couple of good places in, in uh, Calumet to check out, too. But the Keweenaw Wall is one of the mysteries that's out there. Now we're going to go down to old Nama. This I used to live in Nama, so I know this one well. This is a small town uh, down on uh, Lake Michigan, halfway between Escanaba and Rapid River. And yet there's, it's very, very small. I left a, a few months ago. When I left, there were 55 people living there. No stores, no gas stations. There is a, uh, this is what it used to look like back in the day. This was a lumbering town. It doesn't look like this much anymore. The channels up at the top are where the ships came in. The, you can see the piers out there. This was a lumbering town. And they, they, had their, they were integrated vertically. They had their own force up north. They built a railroad that came down in. They brought the logs down. They sawed them up here. The smoke is from a burner that was a size huge, like a silo, and they used it to burn the sawdust. Rather than scraping it into Lake Michigan like so many did, they had this thing running 24 hours a day. So this is what it looked like then. Most of this is gone. There are a few things there. And we're going to talk about a strange oddity that is there that you can go and see. This is the name of Inn. It's still there, and it operates as an inn. And they have rooms. To the right, Way over to the right of this picture, you can just see a balcony. That's where the general store is. Uh, I'll, I'm going to come back to the general store and show you a little bit about that. Charlie McIntosh was the owner of this, and he was a lumberman. He would buy and sell forests all across the Upper Peninsula. And when he was waiting for lumbermen to arrive, he had spare time, and he would go to the shore of Lake Superior and pick agates. Now, if you've not seen an agate, it's just a little stone, and they look pretty normal until you polish them. Then they become a semi-precious gemstone, and they're very beautiful. And that, So he would go and pick them, and he had bags of them, and he would bring them back. One day he went out into his garage to wash some of his stones off, 
And he realized one of them had these strange carvings on it. Now, this is an unexplained artifact. If you go up to the name of the internet and say that you want to see the, na the, the, the name of stone, the Macintosh stone it's called, tell them you saw this show. They'll get it out for you so you can see it. That's the actual size. And this was one of the things that he picked up, up in the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula, 50 feet above Lake Superior. Now, this is one side of it. And a lot of this is gobbledygook. A lot of people just don't know. Let's see if I can get a pointer going here for us. No, I can't. All right, so it's not going to let me do that. So lower left uh, is a, a, an unusual object. Some people said it was a bird's head. On the top left, there's a double crescent. People said, ah, that's a crescent moon, so this must be Native American. That was one theory. On the other side, uh, again, on the left, people thought, oh, there's a spider. He's got a big fat body and two legs here and two legs here and legs. That's a spider. And so it must be Native American because that was, had the spider. The other things, nobody knew anything about what it was. So I took this stone to the Ancient Artifact Preservation Society Conference in Escanaba a few years ago. Charlie, let me take it. These are people who study this kind of stuff. Nobody had any idea what it was, but one person said, well, I think that crescent moon might be something else. So I took it back. It was back at the end, sitting in the bar, talking, and uh, some of the guests were there, and he said, well, can we see this, this stone? We want to see the big pictures of it, because it's very hard to see. It's little. So I brought these out, and when this picture was there, a woman was sitting there, and she said, can you flip that over? I said, oh, you want to see the other side again? She said, no, I want you to flip it. I uh, flipped it. And she said, well, that's a man right there. And so we're all, what? And she said, yeah, see, here's a man. Here's his hairline. There's his mouth. There's his eyes. This is his shield. He's kneeling. She said, can everybody see the man's head in that description? So when we started looking at it, then we realized this is another man. These are his shins. He's seated. These are his hands in a position of supplication or prayer. That's his head. And what we thought was the fat spider's body could be a halo indicating that he was a bishop or a holy man. And you can't see it very well in this, but this is a third man. These are the top of his shoulders. He's facing that way. This is the back of his head. He's kneeling, and he has some kind of a shaft in his hands. I'm going to come to what my theory of what this is, but we thought, well, if all that's on this side, let's look at the other side again. Oh, this is a close-up of the man. So for those of you who couldn't see, that's, that's the man in the center. So then we flipped over the other side and turned it over, and now we have, instead of a crescent moon, what we have at the bottom is a double-hulled ship, and this some people say is a bird's head, but those two symbols appear in other carvings in different parts of the world, some from the 1300s in Scandinavia and a couple of other places. That symbol and the, the ship appear together with letters, and when they do, they symbolize to be thrust upon the waters as in a great voyage. When they appear, this is called a buckla. All right, so if that's a, being thrust upon the waters in a great voyage, and the other side shows a knight being blessed by somebody, my theory is that this is a, either a holy stone that was given as a good luck piece for pe somebody going on a voyage, or, and, it, and some people say it's possible because you see the white streak, that white streak was coveted in stones that were going to be blessed. The other idea is that this was given to the captain of a ship by a bishop or a prince as a credit card so he could go to a port and hire men and ships and he could show this symbol and that was his, that he had the right to do that. It's just one of the ideas. This all comes from the fact of where this was found. You know, I don't know if you know much about the copper cu uh, culture in the Upper Peninsula, but there's a whole a lot of evidence that up to a half a million tons of copper were mined by hand on the Keweenaw Peninsula and Isle Royal before the year 1400. And none of it is in the archaeological record of, the, of North America. It just simply vanished. So one of the theories that's out there is that Vikings or somebody else was coming over here and we're having the Native Americans mine this and we're taking it back to Europe to take care, uh, to supply copper for the Bronze Age because you mix tin with copper and you get bronze. And this was the big thing before the Iron Age. So I'm not going to get a whole lot into that. Some of it's in there. If you want to know more about the copper aspect, I could spend an hour just the evidence of that. So this is an Akintosh stone. We really don't know what it actually is. This is just a theory. But it's there. And you can go to the name in. They'll show it to you. You can take a magnifying glass with you because it's...
The general store I mentioned earlier, the general store is still there. At one time you would go there when you worked in this, for this lumber company and everything you needed you could get here. Tobacco, medicines, food, and you paid the company prices. Uh, they still have a big museum on one side, and one wall shows all these artifacts. Up in the upstairs, there's a microwave machine that was used in one of the mental hospitals to bring you back to reality. Still there, still has the, the instructions. Uh, so this is well worth visiting, and they also have live music there. And an interesting incident took place in this general store way back when everything was still operating. There was a guy there who was working with the lumber company, and he was waiting for his schooner, which was going to launch and take him around to where he could catch the train back to Milwaukee. And so he was killing some time in the general store, and he came across a statue very much like this one. He was just kind of looking at this thing. And the proprietor came over and said, oh, I, I see you're admiring this beautiful sculpture. And the guy said, well, I don't know if I'd call it beautiful, but, you know, it, it's kind of different. And he said, well, the guy said, well, yeah, it's a very unusual statue. And the guy says, well, the only thing I see unusual, other than how bad it looks, is that there's no price on it. Everything else here has a price. There's no price on this statue. And the storekeeper said, well, it's because this has two prices. See, if you just want this beautiful sculpture to sit in your home, you know, which everyone will comment on, it's five bucks. But if you want to know the history and the mystery behind this statue, it's another 50. It's 55 total. The guy's like, geez, 55 bucks is a lot of money. He said, but, you know, Mother's Day is coming. I got to get her something nice. Uh, he said, I'm in a hurry. My boat's going to go. Here's five bucks. Just give it to me. Don't even bother to wrap it. I'll wrap it when I get it. So he takes his, and he's going. And he's walking down the street, down the boulevard, headed around to where the piers were, you know. And you ever had that feeling that someone's watching you? You ever get that feeling that somebody's... Well, he starts to get that feeling like he's being watched, and he looks around, and sure enough, behind him, following him, is a big, fat rat. He's got his statue, and there's a rat following him. He keeps going, and the feeling gets stronger, and he looks back, and now there's about a dozen rats following him. So he starts going faster, then he can hear, and he looks back, and there's hundreds. And he freaks out, and he takes off running, and he runs down, and goes right by his ship, and takes the statue, and throws it onto Lake Michigan as far as it will go into about 15 feet of water, and all these rats come tearing down, right across his feet, jump in the water, swim out and dive down, and they all drown. And he's safe. And he's like, wow, close call. And then it comes to him. And he turns around and he rushes back to the general store. He goes running in, he's looking all over, and the proprietor said, oh, you, you came back to pay me the $50 to learn about the history and mystery of that statue? The guy says, no, I don't care anything about that. He said, you have a statue of a politician This is, all, this is all true. Oh, and speaking of gifts, I have, a, I have a, a tradition. This is April 6th, right? Anybody have a birthday today? Anybody have a birthday? You have a birthday today? This is the 5th? Okay. Anybody have a birthday in April? Just one person has a birthday in April? I'd like to, you to have a copy of what? April? I have an April birthday. What date? 18th. 30th. 30th? So I'm going to give you... <laughs> A birthday present. Happy birthday. And it's signed, yes. So, yeah, well, it's just, I always like to do that. Come back next year, I'll try and get one right at the 30th, so we'll... So now we're going to move on across. I got... So we get, keep going. Now we're going to go to Newberry, right there in the center of the UP, and uh, that's the gateway to Clamadon Falls, so you may drive through there. In 1867, 1869, in that period right in there, a gigantic windstorm blew through the Upper Peninsula, and it knocked down all the trees. I mean, knocked a, knocked a lot of them down. And they, it, the, this is how the rootstock of trees in the Upper Peninsula look. They're, they're, there's only about this much topsoil. And so the roots spread out, and these trees fell down. The farmers were all delighted because it meant they didn't have to go out there and cut them down and pull the stumps. So there, the, the Magura brothers were out on their farm, and in the rootstock of one tree, they found a statue. In fact, they found three statues stuck in the roots of this tree. This is what the statues looked like. This is the actual photograph from 1896. This photograph was sent to the Smithsonian Institute. You can see you've got a tall one like a man, a medium one like a woman, and a little one like a baby. It caused a great stir. Everybody came around looking at it. The people from Sault Ste. Marie came down from the Chippewa County Historical Society. Nobody knew what these things were. They also found this tablet, which you see in the lower left with these strange carvings on it. 
And no one could figure out what this was. They sent these photographs off to the Smithsonian Institute. The Smithsonian Institute couldn't decipher the tablet. Uh, and uh, the tablet was actually made of a different material than the statues. And so after a sufficient time, the Smithsonian Institute came back and said, the whole thing's a hoax. These guys faked it. Well, times are still tough in the UP, and they were really tough then. People didn't have time to argue about it. Everybody had to get back to work. And these ended up going into storage for many, many years and were completely forgotten about. Then the museum moved to a different location, and they were going through things, and they found the old newspaper articles, and one of the old guys said, oh, I remember this. Yeah, these are around here somewhere. And they published a picture of the, uh, the tablet in a newspaper. Uh, this is a copy of that photograph. Well, a, a young man who was going to university down at U of M happened to see this picture, and he called him on the phone, and he said, um, I know what that is. He said, I grew up in that part of the world. I know exactly what that is. And they said, well, tell us about it. He said, well, first you have it upside down. You got to turn it over. So he said, this is a Hittite Minoan tablet. This is from the island of Crete. This is from Gnosis, the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. And what this was used for was used by holy men to tell the future. And what they would do, let's say you're going to get married and you want to know if you're going to have babies, or you're going to start a business or go on a voyage and you want to know if you're going to have good luck. They would take this tablet and throw it down on the ground and throw seeds on it. Wheat or oats or corn, something like that. And then they re would record when birds would come and eat those, which symbols were picked up. And from that they could tell you if you're going to have a successful marriage or if it's successful that's what this was for. You can look up this up on the internet. I'm giving you a very brief uh, translation, but this has all been verified, and these things actually existed and still do. And if you want to go see these, this is the, one of the heads of one of the statues. Uh, if you want to go see these, they're at the Fort de Baud Museum in downtown St. Ignace. You walk in, they're in the first part behind beautiful uh, windows environmentally controlled so they don't deteriorate. They have all the original newspaper articles. To this day, nobody has any idea how the statues or how the tablet got to that field. The tree they were found in, I'm told, was 150 years old. So that'll give you some idea of how long it had been there. And that's the tale of the Newberry statues. There's a lot more I could tell you about, but we have to keep going, so we're going to come down to the lower peninsula now, and now we're over just south of Alpena, and we're going to go to the Neguagon State Park. Neguagon State Park is one of the last unimproved state parks in Michigan. Uh, this is a very unusual state park. The, there are only four campsites. You cannot drive to your campsite. You can drive to a place where you can park your car, and when you park your car, there's two vault toilets and an artesian well, and that's it. So whatever you're going to take, you have to take it with you. And you're going to have to schlep it back to your campsite. The first campsite is almost a half a mile in from where you park. Campsite number two is another quarter mile. Campsite number three is another quarter to a half mile. And then campsite number four is, I'll show you exactly where campsite number four is. So there are two mysteries inside Negragon State Park. By the way, this is rush hour at Negragon. Uh, I've been there several times, and you, I've only ever seen one other person actually camping there, because it's very, very remote. Uh, and if you forgot something, like food or something like that, you got to drive about five miles of two tracks to get to the first dirt road before you can get back to Black River. So it takes a little planning, but if you're after solitude and dark skies, this is the place. So when you go in, uh, when you go into Negragon, you go up this path, you go by campsite number one, campsite number two, you come to campsite number three, and the trail splits. If you take the right-hand split, you suddenly come out of the forest into a prairie like this, and those trees at the end, that is Lake Huron, and that's where campsite number four is. But what is here is one of the mysteries. To the left of where she is is an old apple tree. If you walk over there carefully, carefully, you'll come to this old stone well that was dug by hand. It was dug by hand by a man named Tom. I do not know his last name. He lived back here in the 1800s. He was a black man who was a freed slave who lived here by himself. And if you go to this to see what I'm going to show you next, you'll see how remote this site actually is. If you turn around and look back the other way from the well, you'll see some flat areas. That is the foundations of where his cabin and his shed were. And he lived out there, and he would trap and hunt all winter long. And then he would go into Black River to trade for the things that he needed, coffee, sugar, whiskey, whatever he needed. Uh, and one year he didn't show up. 
And pretty soon people noticed, well, gee, I don't know what, where Tom is. He should be here by now. It's, the roads have cleared, the snow's gone. So they went out looking for him, and they got out to his cabin. They went into his cabin. Everything was in good order. His weapons were there. His clothing was there. Everything was put away neatly. So they went out to the shed. There were no footprints anywhere. Of course, they'd had snow. Went out to the shed. Everything was in good order there. His pelts were all bundled up. It looked like he was getting ready to leave. Everything was in good order, but he was not there, and he was never found ever found. No, no sign of him. So they don't know if bears got him or uh, Bigfoot or uh, you know aliens, but Tom was gone. So that's one mystery. The other mystery you can go and visit, and it's a little more intriguing than even this is, when you get to campsite number three, instead of taking right, go left. You'll go 100 feet and you'll come to a little stream. Don't cross the stream. Go down into the swamp, and it's going to be kind of wet, so you want to plan for it. And you have to go this time of year or after the first hard frost, otherwise you'll never find what I'm going to show you. You'll go in just 100 yards or so, and you'll start coming across these cairns, like this one. There are 17 of these around the structure I'm going to show you. This is big. That's six feet across. Nobody knows who built these. So there are 17 of these laid out, and then there are these walls. Now this wall runs straight as an arrow back, and then you can see other walls back there. What you're looking at is a structure that's 75 yards wide and two football fields long. And the walls will go straight and are perpendicular corners. They're obviously man-made. There are rooms. Some rooms have doors and windows. Some have nothing. Uh, some of these have what appear to be gates that you could get into. Others have just little walkways through, and some are just squares. Uh, and this is a complete mystery as to what this is. Now, the archaeologist who told me how to find this told me that French fur traders who came here in the late 1600s came across this structure and asked the local tribes who, what it was for, what, who built it. They said they didn't know. It was in ruins then. So nobody knows who, when it was built. Nobody knows who built it, and no one knows what it was for. And I've surveyed it. I've drawn it out. It is not a fortification of any kind. I thought maybe the cairns were, you know, guard towers. The archaeologist also told me that the walls you're seeing here are actually the tops of walls that are six to eight feet tall. And that's how much this has silted in since then. And they did a couple of simple digs, nothing extravagant. They never found any bone needles, no stone hammers, no, no stone points, nothing of any kind, not even a place where there was a fire. So nobody knows who built it, when it was built, or what it was built for. I don't give the exact directions to this because we don't want people going in there and digging, but if you decide to go, if you go this time of year or after the first frost and just go to that creek and follow it down, you'll walk right down it and you'll be amazed at how huge it is. And at the far south end of it, back in all this mess, see how wild it is. And of course the nettles get armpit deep in the summer so you can't. Back in there, is a, uh, there are stone graves. There are a number of graves that have stones over them. I know that that's what they are because I've visited prehistoric grave sites out in, on Beaver Island and there is the identical. But nobody knows who they are or what's in there. So this is just one of the mysteries. A lot of these were in Michigan. Most of them are now gone uh, because agriculture. But this was turned into a state park before the agriculture people ever got there, so this was never disturbed, and it's still there. There's actually some, there's an, actually an Indian burial mound, an effigy mound, this, a salamander that's 70 feet long out near Bath. That it's in the Rose, uh, Rose Lake State Recreation Area, if you know where to go find it. It's in one of my books, actually, <laughs> the directions for that. This is pretty wild. You can't get lost if you get disoriented in there, or if you, like I so often do, as Kathy can tell you, forget my compass. All you have to do is listen. You can hear the sound of Lake Huron. You're only about 150 yards from the lake. You can hear it hitting on the shore, so you can always find your way back to the main path that will take you back out. And just south of here is the Sturgeon Point Lighthouse. This is, so, you, again, once you get out, there are dark skies here, so if, you get, if it's dark, you can be able to know which way is south because you'll be able to see the lighthouse. So Helga was with me on one of these trips. I'll just have to give you a quick character study on Helga. Helga's a friend of mine who lives in Ohio. She's an artist, and she follows some of my travels, and every now and then she'll want to meet me because she'll want to see certain things, and she wanted to see the ruins at Negwagon. She's very tough, um, very beautiful woman, very smart, but she's not one of these slender modern girls who's out riding bikes and climbing walls. She's a little heftier than that, you know, robust. In fact, if she came in right now, you would say that is the best looking Olympic hammer thrower I've ever seen in my life. And she's got the personality to go with that too. 
So she wanted to go, and so she's a lighthouse nut. She said, well, you got to take me down to the Sturgeon Point Lighthouse. I got to, you know. And so I was telling her about the history that they used to catch so many sturgeon here that they would actually break their nets back in the day when they were harvesting sturgeon from this point. Somehow we got over on to Jonah and the whale. I think I said something about that some people say in the Bible the story of Jonah and the whale is a, a mistranslation. It should actually say great fish, not whale, or even sturgeon. And that some people say the sturgeon got big enough to swallow a man back in those days. Helga's response was that she really didn't care what my opinion was. Her Bible said whale. That was good enough for her. And I said, no, I, I'm not arguing about, I'm not arguing the point. I'm just saying that there's a school of thought that says it could have been a f different kind of fish. And she said, well, I don't care what your school taught you. It's a whale. She said, and if I need to know that, when I go to heaven, I can just ask Jonah myself. So there which is where I should have left it, right? But I wanted to litigate. I said, well, what if Jonah's not there? She said, what do you mean? I said, what if Jonah's not in heaven? What if you went to hell instead? How about that? She gave me that beautiful smile and said, well, then you'll be able to ask him. <laughs> so we're going to come down to Baldwin now. I'll keep things moving along here. <clears throat> this is where you'll find the Shrine of the Pines. This little tiny building here is a remarkable museum. This has the largest collection of white pine rustic furniture in the world. They're open from May 1st till Labor Day. Uh, if you have any interest in how this kind of woodworking was done, you have to go and see this place. It's all the work of one man, Raymond Overholzer, who's been long gone. This is the interior. There are over 200 pieces inside. That's his desk back in the back. This is his dining room table, his chairs. I'm going to touch on these. There are, his beds are there, the fireplace is there. The fireplace is built with 70 tons of stone. There's a gun rack that revolves, and it revolves on 39 perfectly hand-carved ball bearings. Everything in here was done by hand, without power tools, without electricity. He did this by kerosene light. He was the keeper of this grounds, and in the winter, he would go out and bring stuff in. That table, here's his, uh, I'll go back to that. This is uh, his desk, and you'll see that the legs are open. And what they'll do is they'll come around and they'll touch one of these burls and these concealed compartments will pop open. You can't even see that it's there until they do it. A lot of the furniture had those things in it. This table is made from a single white pine stump that's seven, seven feet across. He sliced his own veneer and hand inlaid it and then developed his own finishes to protect it. And he did all this by hand, all without power tools. You can see the beautiful chairs. This is his card table, once again. <clears throat> and all this stuff is in fantastic condition. This is a rocking chair. I had a video of this, but it stopped functioning for some reason. I used to build rustic furniture. The rocking chair is the holy grail, because you have to get the rockers balanced just right. You can see his are handmade. I was never able to do it. I had to buy rockers and build the chair into it. This is so perfectly balanced that you can go over and give it a push, and it will oscillate more than 50 times on one push. So, and even the windows, with the light is coming through, even the windows, and I thought I had a picture of the windows, the windows back there, they have little signs on the window that say, please don't touch the window, because they're so perfectly clear, people think there's nothing there. And they're actually made of crystal rather than glass, and he made the frames for it too. So this is the uh, Shrine of the Pines, a fantastic place to go, I think the tour is $4. And so if you have any interest in it, take the kids, they won't believe somebody did this by hand. Now we're going to bounce all the way across the state over to the Thumb to Port Sanilac. <clears throat> this is right on the Thumb, and the nearest town here is Port Sanilac. And this part of the Thumb was wiped out in the 1870s by firestorms, tremendous firestorms. Because it's very flat there, and there's a constant westerly wind. And these firestorms would start in the summer by lightning or someone striking a match. One of these storms came so fast that it wiped out the entire town of Forrester except one building, and the people there only saved their own lives by running and jumping into Lake Huron. That's how fast it came across. 298 people died in that one day from this storm. The heat was so intense that railroad rails warped. So this happened two or three times, but one thing that did happen is when the fire went out in this particular area, the wind kept blowing, and it had burned off all the topsoil, it burned off all the loam, and the wind was blowing it all away, and it revealed a set of carvings the Sanilac petroglyphs. This is a close-up 
of the man with the bow. And we're going to come back to him. This is on a piece of sandstone that's out on Germania Road. You can go there. There's no charge to go in. It's all protected now. This is a part of that sandstone. And there are hundreds of carvings in it. This is a rabbit. That is a line of coyote tracks that goes almost perfectly south to north. These are all carved. They're not, they were not made by a coyote, and then it petrified. It's sandstone. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these, and there's a lot of controversy about who, who did it. And it, it, no, you know, there are three different tribes that chain, claim that they were involved. This is a sketch of some of the... So you've got... Um, I don't have a pointer, so I'm going to have to walk over here. You've got this symbol, which could be a water symbol, or it could be a sea serpent. You've got a horse. You've got thunderbirds. Here's a thunderbird. There's another thunderbird here somewhere. Some people say they even find scripts in this. I've never done a complete study of it. But if you go, and there's, they have... Uh, tour guides there who will take you through and show you everything that's there. And I showed you earlier there was a hole. Some of the petroglyphs before, when this was first discovered, some people went and cut glyphs out. And the only thing that's not showing up here are eagles and bears. So that's what they think were stolen was the eagles and bears. So that is the St. Elite petroglyphs. It's the only verified uh, stone carvings in Michigan. And it's supposed to be prehistoric. It's supposed to have been done by Native Americans. So I'll give you a quick explanation of some of these. So down at the bottom is a coyote. On the bottom right is a spiral, and which is a, a universal sign of infinity, uh, or the infinite, except in Australia. If you see this carved or painted in Australia, it means a spring is nearby. That's the only continent where it's different. There uh, is a bird foot, rabbit's foot. <clears throat> and then the man up there, and this caused a lot of controversy. Here's the people said, well, it can't be Native American because Native Americans didn't wear conical hats. All right, so here's one interpretation, just one, so I have to make sure everybody knows that there's, there's only one of them, because there are several, and I don't, want any, I don't want the Ashkenazis to come after me, or some other tribe to come after me for getting it wrong. This is a holy man, and that is not a hat. His arrow is the teachings of the tribe. Everything was done by oral, oral tradition. There was no writing. Everything was taught by storytelling, and the arrow is all the knowledge that he wants to send from himself to future generations. The bow represents the power of the spoken word. And so by telling the stories in oral traditions, he hopes that they'll learn the, the values and traditions of the tribe. That's what those two parts of it. The hat represents the duality of human nature. One side is the physical, the logical side. That's the storytelling and telling them the, the actual uh, traditions. The other side is the spiritual side where he's hoping he's doing a good enough job in sending his hopes to the great spirit that it will all work and the tribe's traditions will be carried on. So that's one explanation of that one symbol and the docents at the, at the uh, Petrodos will tell you lots of other fascinating stories. If you can't get over there but you ever go to the casino in Mount Pleasant, behind the casino is a, uh, a Native American cultural center and they have a mock-up of this in that, so you can see what it looks like. Then there's the hand. The hand uh, caused a lot of controversy too because as you can see it has six digits. We know that we know that uh, some tribes had a tradition of cutting off one digit for mourning. If you watch uh, Dancers with Wolves, Kevin Costner found the white woman out on the prairie. She was bleeding. She was in mourning. She'd cut one of her fingers off because her husband had been killed in battle. So she was in mourning. And that was one of the ways they did that. There are hands at petroglyphs that have five digits. This one has six. So because of that, some people said, well, either aliens or giants did this. Because they said, you know, giants are supposed to have six digits. So just so you know, it's, it could be a lot of different things. Speaking of giants, <laughs> this is the story about the Cardiff giant. Uh, now, this story did not start in Michigan, but part of it ends in Michigan. This is a banner that was created by uh, P.T. Barnum to promote the Cardiff Giant. This happened back in the early 1900s up in upstate New York. A farmer was, had hired some guys who were out digging the foundation for his, uh, his barn. And they came across an 11 foot tall, 3,000 pound petrified man. And that is the drawing of the Cardiff Giant. This is the photograph of the Cardiff Giant, as they're bringing him out of the ground. This caused a great sensation. In those pe days, people, every home had a Bible. People read their Bibles. In the Bible, it says that there were giants in the earth in those days, and now somebody had gone and dug one up. 
People were coming from all over to come out and see the giant. P.T. Barnum came out because he wanted to get the giant for his greatest show on earth. And he had the American Oddities Museum in New York, and he wanted the giant for that. But the farmer was too smart for that. He said, no, not going to do it, because he knew just from the trap he already had, that all he had to do was build the right kind of wagon and head over and head down the East Coast and go to all the towns and people would pay good money to come and see the giant, which is what he did. That didn't stop P.T. Barnum. P.T. went and bought himself a three, a, a nine foot, excuse me, a, an 11 foot long piece of granite and hired a couple of sculptors and had them carve him a copy. And then he put acid on it and dirt on it and set it on fire to age it. And then he put it on his wagon and they headed west to come out to the Midwest to wow all the towns out, Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, all that. Now, the story is told that eventually P.T. Barnum hit the Mississippi River, so he swung back and started heading back east. The farmer got down as far as south New Jersey. There was nothing south of there, so he decided to head west. And they say that at one point in time, P.T. was coming in from the west to a town, and the farmer was coming from the east into the same town. Now, <clears throat> P.T. had already had his guys out and were putting posters all over, and the farmer was very upset because P.T. was showing a fake. So he went to a judge in town to try and get an injunction to stop P.T. Barnum. And the judge gave him the injunction to stop P.T. from being able to show his copy. About this time, the chemical uh, tests for the original one came back. Tra things were slower in those days. We didn't have Facebook or anything, so news traveled slow. And it turned out that the original was also a fake. And they had found the guys who carved it for the, the farmer, and they said that they had carved it for him and dug the hole and buried it a year before, and he'd left it there for a year so it could age. And then they, he hired other people to come and dig in that spot, and lo and behold, they found it. So the farmer was out of business, even though he had gotten the judge to prevent P.T. Barnum from showing his fake of the farmer's hoax. P.T. was not stopped, though. He was smart. He kept going right on east, went to New Jersey City, went to Jersey City in New Jersey, put his on a boat, and went to Europe, and traveled very successfully for three years, very profitably, before the news finally caught up that the whole thing was a hoax. Now, I don't know where the original is, but I know where the copy is. The copy is in Farmington Hills. At Marvelous, at Marvelous Marvelous Mechanical Museum. And if you've never been to this museum, you really need to go. It's astounding. 5,000 square feet of stuff you wouldn't even be allowed to make anymore. They got machines in there, you would stick your hand in it, and then your mother-in-law would crank it to see how much electricity you can take. And it's all hands-on, it's free to go in, kids can play with it. So I was going to go down there to see if the giant was still there. And Helga was in the area. I said, Helga, come on, go with me. To, we're going to go down and see if the Cardiff Giants down at Marvelous Marvel. She said, no, I'm not going to any more museums with you. They're full of greasy old tools and dust and dirt. I don't want... I said, no, no. It's going to be great. You'll love it. And if you'll go with me, I'll take you to Marshall's, to Marshall on the way back, and we'll stop at Shuler's and get a prime rib dinner. She said, I'm in. So we went, and we go in, and this is what you're confronted with as soon as you walk in. It is utter chaos. And the whole thing is like this, just jammed with stuff. All these machines work, old pinball machines, stuff you haven't seen in, in years and years and years. So I go tearing off, and I go in, I talk to the girl at the, the, the uh, refreshment stand. She doesn't know about any stupid giant. You know, I'm looking all over the place. I find the electric chair. Uh, <clears throat> I can't find it. Finally, I stumble around to the very back corner, and there is the giant. The Cardiff Giant, one of history's great hoaxes, and it's standing there. This is the copy that uh, P.T. Barnum made. So I turned to Helga to say, God, it's really here. What do you think? Well, she was not there. So I look all over. I can't find her. In fact, I'm still lost in the museum. I can't find her anywhere. So finally, I grabbed my phone and I texted her. I said, where are you? And the text came back, all caps, all capital letters. I'm still at the front entrance. So I knew I was in trouble because I'd go tearing off so fast I'd left her behind and she'd been standing up there all this time. So I go up, and here she is, uh, and as soon as I come around the corner, she says, get, get, get 20 bucks. Get, give me $20 worth the quarters out of that machine right there. I said, what do you want quarters for? She said, I'm, I'm busy. So she'd been playing all these machines. She gave up on me. She's playing the drunk machines. Play, and this machine she's playing is the Love Shack. And in the Love Shack is a bearded, cigar-smoking, diaper-clad midget. And he, you put money in there, and he tells you your love prospects. Well, Helga didn't like the answer she was getting. So her solution was to pump more money in there. 
I said, what do you need him for? I'm right here. She said, you don't have a prayer unless you give me that $20. So we did that. And uh, we went off and, and had a great dinner at Schuler's. And this place is still there. I was just there a couple of years ago. The Giant's still there. Uh, it's still a fabulous place to go. And right next to it, by the way, is a Buffalo Wild Wings. So if you have to go get out and go have beer real quick, you can get right next door to it's that. Downtown Farmington Hills. Old Orchard Road. So this was where I left the people from Wisconsin. You remember the people from Wisconsin? I was going to leave them here because I figured anybody could find Ohio from, you know, from Detroit. And, uh, but they were giving me a hard time before I, when I'd sent all this off to them. This was where I had stopped. They were giving me a hard time. They said, well, you didn't say anything about Traverse City. I said, well, I don't do Famous. You know, I don't do Mackinac and I don't do Traverse City. I don't do it. They said, yeah, but we do. And we're going to go back the same way, and we want to go to Traverse City. I said, well, enjoy it. You know, there are cherry pies and there are shops. And they said, yeah, yeah, but you got to know something, you know. I said, yeah, but I just don't go. And they said, well, if we, we made you go, what would you do in Traverse City? And I said, well, I would go and pay my respects to the memorial that was built for Calantha Walker. That's what I would do. Well, they didn't know who Calantha Walker was. And I explained to them, Calantha Walker uh, lived in Traverse City for 18 years. 16, 17 years, uh, and set records that have never been broken. There are universities that have programs designed specifically to break Calantha Walker's records. Uh, Calantha grew up here. This is the old state mental hospital in Traverse City. That's what it looked like when it came out of the ground. Fantastic structure. Uh, it had four stories up. There are one or two levels of tunnels underneath. So you could take a patient from one end to the other in the winter without ever having to go outside. And this was where the worst of the worst cases went. Once you were a patient here, you never came out. And they even built, uh, planted tall trees all along the front, along the road, so people would forget that the hospital was there. It was completely self-contained, had its own police, had, of course, the, the doctors, had its own kitchens, had its own telephone system, had its own sewer system, had its own fire department. And you didn't ever have to leave. And at one point, the population of this hospital was greater than the population of Traverse City at the time that this was out. Now, of course, all these were closed in the 1960s. And so today, <coughs> excuse me, today, this is known as the Commons. And they have turned it into a, a mercantile. There are shops there, bistros there. They have tours of the tunnels, and they do a Halloween thing. They have, uh, one end of it has been turned into a very high-end retirement community. Helga's mother thinks that'd be a good place for me to send, spend my golden years, you know, locked up in the old insane asylum. So I, I told the, the people from, um, you know, this was where Helga grew up, spent her whole life here, never left. And she was the only resident who was ever buried on the grounds. And her tomb is still there. And if you drive up to the commons like this, you can either go right or go left. And if you go left around, you'll go down this little road and you'll see these two giant black willow trees on either side of a little bridge. You go across the bridge and there is the memorial site for Calantha Walker. Clamp, they actually have a, uh, a, uh, a festival there. It's celebrating everything milk because Calantha Walker was a cow. She set records that have never been broken. She was a world champion. She's produced 200,000 pounds of milk, her 7,500 pounds of butterfat. Her one-year record was 22,918 pounds of milk. One year. Now, I, don't, I went here to see the, the, the memorial. I'll show it better. There it is. That's her headstone. But I was hoping to find a picture of the milkmaid who milked this cow. Because I, I wanted to see the forearms on this babe. I mean, I milked cows when I was growing up. That is, I mean, if you can get five gallons of milk out of a cow in a sitting, you're working. So 22,000 gallons of milk, Calantha Walker. And yes, there is a university in Japan that has a program to trying to beat these records. These records have been broken with milking machines, but never without mechanical assistance. So Calantha Walker. By the way, if you go, also, if you go to... Traverse City, and you want a good place to eat, go to Sledders. Sledders is not downtown, you know? Did you, did you kiss the buffalo? You're supposed to, moose, the moose, right. Yeah, so Sledders is off the beaten path. Uh, it's been there so long, it opened up five years after George Armstrong Custer had that bitty, bit of bad luck out of the Little Bighorn. That's how long it's been there. And the food is still great, so that's called Sledders. So, um, that's the show. I want to thank you guys for sitting through the stories. I'm really glad you came out. It was great to be here. Thank you. So, questions?
make sure it's a good question because this is being recorded. That's why they gave me this, this right here. Well, Kathy's back there. I told her, don't, don't ask a question I can't answer because it's going to be recorded. So. Uh, no, but <laughs> that actually though that's at uh, the Legs Inn in Cross Village. That that thing is in the the lobby of, of the Legs Inn. Yeah. That scares you away from something. Yeah. That's one big throw. Yeah, exactly. So the Legs Inn is at the upper, the northernmost point of the Tunnel of Trees. For those of you who don't know where the where Cross Village is. It was just bad luck all around. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I used to build rustic furniture, and uh, in the process of selling that furniture, I would go and do arts and crafts fairs, and I was so broke that I had this big old truck and a big old trailer, and I would haul this stuff around to the craft shows, and I couldn't, go out, I couldn't get above 55. So I never went on the interstate. So I'd go through all these little towns, and I'd go, gee, I didn't know that was there. I didn't know that. And so I began to compile this stuff, and I built the website, Michigan Back Roads, dot com to learn how to build websites so I could build one for a catalog for my furniture. It was all supposed to be something else. And then it, as it grew and grew and grew, because I have a great love of Michigan history, when I would go around and, and meet people, and then I did my first book, people said, oh, well, did you know about this? Or did you know about that? And a lot of it was rumor. Sometimes I, I have some old, old Michigan history books that tell stories about things that you can go and find that they don't tell you about anymore. And then, of course, there was a, the occasional snipe hunt I would be sent on. You know, I would go to a town at 6.30 in the morning, go to the coffee shop, and in the back would be a round table with a bunch of old guys drinking coffee. And I would go tell them I would pay for their coffee and their breakfast so they could tell me about stuff around that I needed, you know, for my research. And usually they would send me on some pretty good stuff. But every now and then, they would send me off, you know, and there was nothing. I would always go back. You know, that was a good one, guys. That was a good one. That, that method of research doesn't work anymore because now when I go in and go to the back, I'm older than all those guys. So, but a lot of it was, was just luck and, and a lot of times going and touring museums, uh, you would find out about stuff and, and the Cardiff Giant, I can't even remember now how I heard about that or even part of it was in Michigan because it's been so long ago. So, I guess you just, you focus on something enough eventually. You, and I still have a whole lot of stuff that I've never put into books or into any of these talks that I just haven't gotten to yet. Yes. If you were going to the So the question was, I have to repeat this for the, if, if I was going to go to the Charlevoix area, is there anything worth, <clears throat> actually, yeah, there, there are a number of, of things. Um, if, you, if you're a nature person, you should go out to Mix, Mount Mixaba, uh, which is uh, very, never advertised, it's a little bit north of town, and they have a ski area there, but they have great, trails that go through the dunes, and one of them goes between the dunes, and the winds are so strong coming off the lake, it's called Tornado Alley. It'll pick you right up. That, that's interesting. If you head toward Boyne City, <coughs> excuse me, uh, on the Charlevoix Boyne City Road, you'll see a little sign that says Green Sky Hill Church. Take that turn and go up, and go up into that churchyard, and behind that church is the largest Native American, Christian Native American grave site, graveyard in Michigan. But when you drive back out, you'll come and you have to turn. If you stop and you look straight out into a field, you'll see six or seven now, but there used to be eight gigantic maple trees in a perfect circle. And that site was a site where three different tribes would meet for councils back before we all got here. And those trees are still there, but a couple of them have fallen down from winters and things. But you can, and they're on private property, but you can barely, very clearly see the uh, council trees out there. So there's a lot of cool stuff up that way. Uh, Ernest Hemingway's first marriage certificate is in the museum. I don't know how many, how many times he got married, but that's one of the things in the, in the historical museum in Charlevoix, too. You bet. Yes. I do not. Uh, <clears throat> I got stymied by the, by the COVID. I was supposed to go visit the uh, Masonic Temple there, which is supposed to be one of the great structures in all of Michigan. And I was trying to get a tour of the, the salt mines. And I was going to do that too. 
Yeah, so I, I, I have not been. So it's, 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 on, it's on the list. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know. But hopefully I'll find out. Okay. Thank you so much.